disciples. There's a reason for that. And uh, I truly, truly do want you to become disciples of Jesus Christ. I really, really do. But there's a way you become a disciple. And John 8, 31 says, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will what? Set you free. That becoming a disciple and being a disciple means that you continue. You, you, you are my disciples if you remain faithful in my teachings. Say that, faithful, faithful. in my teachings. And so, so many churches and people have been uh, guilty of not following or continuing in the word. Um, teaching um, is, is foreign uh, to some whole ministries. How many of you came from churches where there wasn't a whole lot of teaching, but a whole lot of preaching? And it was from the pulpit. And you cannot disciple people with preaching or alone. It just won't work. Uh, God gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. And a lot of times, um, I've been teaching for a long time, teach seminary, I've been teaching Bible school for years. I was, I was 20, 28 years old and was teaching world religions at Florida State Community College. And so... You know, I've been doing this for quite, quite some time. And uh, I have had the misfortune, though, of being the pastor, where uh, I used to teach Sunday school, I used to teach math Sunday school, I used to teach classes in, within the church. But when I, you know, you have staff and you have people, you have some of the competent people that we have, you have to share, you have to delegate. So I kind of pushed me to just the pulpit when it comes to a member's and people in the church. So now all you hear is me preaching. And so some people come into a ministry and they wind up in a class and for the first time they got hands on in a class and they get they draw to that person that teaches them. And and so a lot of times in churches you can feel some division and derision, my class, my teacher, my elder, my this, my that. And overall though, and you hear people say, "Well, he just preaches." And uh <laughs> And then I just taught them <laughs> to teach you, <laughs> you know. And so, you know, we have to have this kind of engagement. And I just really feel like I need this kind of engagement with uh, the, the, the true disciples and the people who really want to become all that God wants them to become. Uh, now, at this hour, uh, every day, every Sunday, there's a second class, Elder Scheider will be teaching that class along with one another elders and um, it'll be for those who are visiting those who uh, come extremely late um, I'm not gonna put up with that I'm gonna make him put up with that <laughs> but uh, but they will uh, definitely um, be a class for that uh, when I was in school and seminary, you didn't come late to class. You got tardy. You you after you were late two times in high school, they just sat you out the door. Like you, how you gonna learn now? You sitting outside, but you got tardy slips, and then too many lates got you a referral, and a referral got you a suspension. And so why do we stop when we get matured and we get old? We don't have that kind of discipline in our lives. We need that kind of discipline. That's the root of disciple discipline and so many people prove to not be uh, able to be corrected or disciplined which proves that they're not really sons and daughters the bible said but illegitimate or bastards and so you can really tell if somebody's true and somebody's sincere about becoming all that god wants them to be they can take correction and instructions many as the father loves he chastens and he rebukes all right, so these are scriptures and things that we need to learn because so many people learn the good stuff. We want to hear about faith. We want to hear about how to do this and how to do that. But what about the discipline that it takes? What about discipling? What about becoming what God wants you to be, not what you want to be? And so getting to know God and getting to know who God is and, uh, is important to me. Uh, I've been in this thing now, uh, July 19th will be my 40th year of salvation, 40th year, 
And so, you know, I'm like, okay, that's a huge number, right? Uh, Pastor Kobe Nesbitt was born July 19, uh, 1983. I was born again July 19, 1983. Uh, and we have a little bond there that just going on. But it marks my 40th year of, of loving God. And uh, I started out um, being discipled and uh, by the Holy Spirit, actually. Um, I uh, read the Bible twice before I ever attended a religious service. I had never been inside the doorways of a church building at 26 years old, but once in my life. And at one time I went, literally, I had smoked weed in the church bathroom when I got there, didn't know no different, and sat on the front row and dared that preacher to say something to me and just fell asleep, 17 years old, home from college. And that was it. That's all I knew about God. I had never heard a sermon. I had never heard a preacher. I was 26 years old. I was home and uh, conviction and people had sold the seed and people had planted and people had watered. And uh, my wife, when she was here with me, I think Taz, we told Pastor Taz, we, we had a seven day party, seven straight days in my home, seven every day, every night. And on the seventh day of the last day, several of them got up and they wanted to go to a worship service. And uh, I just, I just didn't understand it. How we parted and smoking weed and drinking and you want to go to church? What is that? And then uh, when they got ready to leave, what made it even more interesting, when they got ready to literally leave, they uh, asked me would I pray with them before they come. We had about eight of them that came from Memphis that were with us, stayed at our home the whole week. And they, they wanted me to pray with them before they left. And I panicked. The fear came over me. I had never really prayed. And I ran in my house, got in the closet, pulled a blanket over me, and hid in a closet in my house, and I had a big house. I was in one of the closets, and they waited on me for about an hour. I never came back out, and I heard the van start up and pull off, and I was just in there shaking and trembling and scared and weeping. And when they were gone, my wife couldn't even find me, and then about 45 hour, minutes, an hour later, I came out of the closet. I came out of the closet. <laughs> So I came out of the closet in 1983. <laughs> Thought I'd share that with y'all. So as we look at today's lesson, I want, I want to scan the audience. Let me get the PowerPoint and uh, let's see what we have up here. Um, uh, my, bid, my mission for this is to renew minds and change lives by purposely guiding you through a study of historic and biblical Christian theology concerning the person of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Now, these, you'll be able to get the link to this, and then starting next week, it'll also be streamed um, online and um, for people to watch. Um, so my mission is to renew your mind and to change your life. Um, we need historic and biblical Christian theology. Uh, our theology is shaped by all who have ever lived for God. There's, there's, there's oral tradition, there's something called regula fide, a regula fide, which is just a summation of all that Christianity is that's been passed down over the years. It's a summation of what God is doing. And so there are others greater than us who have wrestled with who God is, who Jesus is, who the Holy Spirit is, historically. And, and again, I'm going to show you something in a minute. There are things called colloquies and consistories, and we know a lot of them as councils. Uh, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Chal Chalcedon, and all of these different councils where people will come together, church leaders and folk, to make sure that what was being preached was sound. They would check the preaching. You couldn't just preach what you wanted to preach back in the day. You had to be checked. And that's what we're going to try to do now and see what did they say? What did they do? How did they get through it? And how does it apply to us today? My goal, my goal is not so much to just teach good theology. 
as important as this is, but my goal is to teach people to think. To teach people to think. It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to have doubts. It's okay to say you don't understand. Remember when Philip in Acts 8 joined the Ethiopian eunuch on the chariot and he had Isaiah 53 and Philip saw him reading it and he said, uh, you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I accept someone guide me or someone teach me? And that's what we need to try to do here. But I'm going to show you how we're going to do this collectively together. How can you understand except somebody guide you, somebody teach you? And there's a lot of unteachable people in the body of Christ. There really are uh, people who we're going to get there in a minute too. Matthew 22, 37 said, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with what? All your mind. Say my mind. I need to love them with my mind. That we need to think. We need to be thinkers. We need to use our mind. Logic is not a dirty word. Logic is who Jesus is. He's the logos, where we get the word logic from. He's the word made flesh. He is what we would in essence call the mind of God. What God had in his mind for us to do, to demonstrate for us, he proved it in the person of his son when his mind became flesh. The logos, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we got to exercise our minds. Now, 2 Timothy 3.14, rather small, but it says, but uh, you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true. For you know you can trust those who taught you. That's where we are right now. If you're a part of this ministry, and if you have any sense at all, you realize that this ministry didn't start, you know, up here somewhere, but it started small and then it grew and it became. My leadership over the years has been tested and proven and tried. I was just talking to Pastor Taz this morning about uh, the college and about uh, being able to vet my teaching around the world in Australia, South America, Africa, Hawaii. I'm an official Hawaiian citizen and stuff. Now, I've been teaching and preaching for a whole long time. Been on the cover of every leading Christian magazine, even the Wall Street Journal did a cover story on us. Christianity Today, Leadership Journal, Executive Church Executive Magazine, Ministries Today, Charisma, all of them. So what do they do? They vet you. They vet you doctrinally. They, they, then they label you. Uh, I remember Stephen Strand came here and he followed us. They were here with us for five days and wrote the article. If you can pull it up later on, the article just said that this was a oasis that people and pastors were coming from all over to examine what we were doing. I was doing all the TBN shows. How many of y'all been to TBN with me here and there over the years? A whole bunch of you been. I used to always wonder, where y'all going? We get on that bus, we go to Miami, I would go to Atlanta, Los Angeles, Dallas, um, and you know, I was doing TBN, New York City, done them all. And so when you do that, the whole world is looking at you and the whole world is scrutinizing what your commentary is, what it is that you're saying. And I said all of that to say, if you're a member of this church, then you ought to trust who's teaching you. There has to be a level of trust there for a member to question uh, the, the, the faithfulness of the teacher or the ability of the teacher to not to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, they had to trust Moses and they had to trust Joshua and they had to trust Elijah and they had to trust Elijah. You trust them. You, you became a part because God supposedly put you here. And if God's, if you follow the Lord and the Lord put you here, if you're that smart, then if you're that deep, then, you know, you know, God put you here and it, you, you know, so if God put you here, then you have to learn how to trust uh, can we back up on the screen? Trust um, who's teaching you. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. What? Rightly dividing the word of truth. You've heard me say this many, many times, and I'm going to say it to you again, till you get it. When Jesus taught, like the Sermon on the Mount and stuff, that wasn't a one-time lesson. 
He said it again and again. Then he took them one day and said, how long have I been with y'all? And you still don't know who I am. He, there's certain things you have to teach over and over and over again until you get it, right? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Here's the expression you've heard me say many times. I'm going to say it again, and maybe it'll jump out at you like a snake under a rock. It's not what the Bible says. It's what the Bible means. How many of you, when you first heard that, you were like, wow, that's what I needed about 10 years ago. Anybody, let me see your hand. You're like, because we've been guilty of quoting scriptures. And we've been guilty of talking about the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, without fully understanding what the Bible means. And so that's what I want to kind of show you, what it, what it means, rightly dividing. And that means you got to get behind the scenes. That means that there's some original language. That means there's some historical concepts and things that other people have worked through. That means that when you read the text now, you'll be reading it with uh, authorial uh, intent. What did the author mean? What did he have in mind when he wrote it? Who was he writing to? How did it apply to them then? How does it affect us today and how did the cross impact it? You got things like etymology, word derivation, over the years, the historical gaps where there's just history, time gaps where there's just a long time ago, the language gap, the etymology where it, the same word used then uh, doesn't mean the same thing now. And that's why you have different translations and even better translations and even now with the use of, we got all of these copies, these originals. We don't have any originals. We have thousands of copies and they all say the same thing. That's one good thing about the Bible. People always talking about, is the Bible true? A white man wrote the Bible, this and that. Ah, and the ham fat over 1500 years, over 40 authors have written and they all seem to say the same story. They never met each other, never talked to each other. And then we have the manuscripts where we can look at it and vet it and try it and, and put it together. And it makes one beautiful tale. It's a meta narrative of how God created the heavens and the earth and how God made everything good. Man messed it up. And then God fixed it up in sending his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to die for the sins of the world. Not for our sins only, but for the sins of the world that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life I need about 10 people to say amen if, if somebody wrote it prejudicially and wrote it for a particular group of people then they messed up because they messed up with one little word whosoever eyes of whosoever alright so then we do a learned theology in community this is so important this is the community. Welcome to our community. We do theology or we study scriptures or we learn about God in community. The Bible is not given to private interpretation. You, you ain't that deep. How many at one time or another though thought you were really deep that you had it? You just read your Bible yourself and you had it. This is what the Bible said. This is what the Bible say. It's just what the Bible say. I read the Bible. I don't read the Bible. And people try to talk to you. I read that. I don't read that. No, no. You need community. That's the vetting. You need to be able to run it by somebody. Somebody needs to be able to look at you and say, you done lost your ever loving mind. Where in the ham fat do you get that from? When you take the Quran, right, where you got Muhammad who entered a cave, who suffered from seizures and whatnot. And anyway, comes out with a book and said, this is one man. To hear from God. You mean tell me I can't check him? If you put that out in community where other people hear from God too and other people have a relationship with God, then you're able to find out who God is, who Jesus is, and who the Holy Spirit is. I was preaching New Year's Eve and I said the key to this thing, a revelation of Jesus Christ, is that we need to know who God is, where he is, what he's doing, and what he's going to do. Right? How many of y'all remember that? Four point. And if you can get that down pat, you'll be a bad mamma jam. You'll be a bad, I was going to say Negro, but we got. <laughs> Tr 
Truth is not found in spirit illuminated individuals, but in a community of spirit illuminated individuals. All right? And notice the word illuminated. Illumination is different than revelation. There is no new revelation. There's nobody going to come along and add to or take away from the prophecies of this book. Right? But what we can get is illumination on the revelation. The revelation has already been given. Everything that we actually need is already there. We just get enlightened. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. All right. So therefore, we believe that the body of Christ, both alive and dead, must come together to understand theology, shaping it from many perspectives and differing experiences. This is doing theology in a community. Now notice what I said there. Remember, I even alluded to it earlier, um, that the body of Christ, both alive and dead. What do I mean by that? That there are others that have gone on before us that left us with information, illumination, inspiration, so that we can learn from them also. You hear me might quote the church fathers uh, uh, the, after Christ died and after the apostles were taken up, there were even the North American prophets, the uh, Alexandrian prophets, where um, the Greek culture now enters into the church. And now there's a lot of metaphor and allegory and types and tropes and simile and stuff where the, the Greek mind, philosophizing mind. Remember when Paul got to Mars Hill, Aeropagus, he says, even your own poets say. And he got there and he started disputing with them. He started quoting the poets and writers because these people were thinkers. And so uh, the Greek influence in the scriptures has caused us to think and to use some logic and reason. And there's nothing wrong with that, remember, because we have to love God with all of our minds. So the scriptures open up to us. Uh, colorful language. Uh, stuff that we talk about you take like the Greek language right with the Bible with the New Testament written in uh, English can I use this word sucks yeah when, when English, English sucks you can lead somebody or you can have lead in a pencil it's the same word and so you can love your dog you can love spaghetti and love your spouse But not in the Greek. You you agape your spouse. You filios your neighbor. You understand what I'm saying? You, so the, the language is different. It's much more colorful. And Hebrew is even more complex than that. And so we got to learn those because the same word is not the same meaning in these different languages. So we have to learn that, right? And then let's see who's in the room. Let's see. Now, this is fun. This is in the room because you might be in here. Mama said you throw a rock and a pack of dogs. The one you holler is the one you hit. So if I hit you, holler. Secret Susie or Sam. Big words scare you. You don't really think that you are smart enough to be a real Bible student with a bishop. You are here. That's what will be today. But if the words get too big, you ain't coming back in him. Let me see all the scared, big words, scared people there. Come on, be honest with me. If you're in here, you're in here. And, 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 and people have done that, right? They'd be like, man, I don't, I don't even know what he was talking about. Colloquies and sisteries and consistory. What was he talking about? And you have to build your vocabulary, right? And when you go into university, I, I attended the University of Tampa my freshman year, uh, barely 17 years old, and I had a professor by the name of Dr. Aylawine who taught political science, and I thought I was going to be a political science, be a governor or something one day, and I took that class, and I just first did a class, I was just blown away, just mesmerized, I walked out of there, said I ain't never going back in there, uh, I don't even know what this man was talking about, and then sure enough, um, the next week we had our vocabulary list. And the next week, we were challenged to learn these terms. And then when you start learning new words, man, you be like, hey, this is cool. Hey, I understand it now. I got it now, right? But there is that old scared Susie and scared Sam Coleman. All right. <laughs> How about this? If you're in here, you holler. Know it all, Nick or Nicky. You already know everything. You just here to see if we know what we're talking about. 
Now you may not hold your hand up, but you're in here. Oh yeah, you already know. You already know. You you even wishing somebody else would teach it. You already know. You you know everything. We can't tell you nothing. We got to shut you up, sit you down. That's why I don't do a whole lot of multifarious queries or a whole lot. There we go, another word. And I, that's, <laughs> there he is, scared Susan back there. Said, I told you that. I I'm told you I'm gone. A uh, lot of Q and A because some people, you know, you just they just they don't really they're not seeking an answer. They're just trying to show you what they know. So what I teach and what I've taught, and I've had some PhDs in my classes and philosophy people and stuff. I remember taking a class um, a few years ago at Gordon Conwell, and then the professor was brilliant, double PhD when he was 26 years old, Oxford University grad. And there's one guy in the class, when they said any questions, he, he would raise his hand, then he would give an answer. He would just make a statement. So enough is enough. So the professor acted like he was scared of him. I literally turned around. I said, if you say one more thing in this class, you say <laughs> I just went off. And everybody in the class went to clapping and carrying on. He just shut him down. I said, but well, nobody care about what you think. You are not the professor here, and you're wrong. I'm from the north side. That's all I had to tell the dude. I don't know what to do. Yeah, I'm, what the heck are you talking about? Shut up. How about fundamental Fred or freedom? You are the God ordained guardian of the truth. You are here to sit with arms crossed and pretend you already know. I was asking for hands. Mama said you throw a rock or a pack of dogs, one that hollers you when you hit. Well, I can see people. Let, let me help you. This is how you get to know your pastor. This is how you get to know him. Listen, how you get to know him. Sit up. Get your arms off the back of the chair. Then when you hear me say those things, right? I'm teaching. Look up. You have to look at people. Body language. I'm a psychology major, right? One of the greatest uh, lessons that I ever learned was body language. People turn you off. People shut you down by their posture. If they're not disabled, if they're not, uh, you know, with some type of sleep apnea or some type of disease, rather sleep disorder, and they're sitting in front of you and you're talking to them and they can't look at you. That says a whole lot about the pain of their past, who they are, their dysfunctional, uh, ad aspect, dysfunctional aspect of their lives. They, they don't get along well with people. There's something going on in them. And so when I'm trying to get a point across and I say, look at me, look at this scripture, look at it. And you don't speaks volumes to me. And then when it's time for me to put people in certain places and do certain things, and somebody bring up your name and I say, oh, that's the dude that never even, is you crazy? <laughs> Just the way it is, right? Traditionalist Terry or Terry. You want to learn, but your traditions and preconceived notions bind you. You are here to have your traditions confirmed to be true, not to learn anything new. I'm from the Apostolic Church of the Firstborn on Sunday morning in Jesus' name. We believe in head coverings. We believe that women are not to wear pants. We believe that you come, I know anybody with a makeup, the lady sitting next to me with this makeup on and smelling all like a Jezebel in here and this and that. <laughs> and you just want somebody to confirm or just to agree with you. It's like, <clears throat> hold on, hold on, scared, Susan. I used to Jesus. <laughs> That's reading into the text, looking for what you already believe about the text, and just reading into the text rather than exegeting. Ex means out, exhale, ex. It means to get out of the text what the author intended when he wrote it. So people who exegete the text, they look into it just to find something that affirms what they already believe. They're not trying to learn, right? 
and your finite minds, nobody gives a flip about what they taught you down at the church of the first frigid day the church of the high steeple and few people. They were wrong. All right? So if you read the text right and you rightly divide the word of truth, then you're going to realize you maybe need to rethink your theology. This ain't where you come from. This is where you're going. Because we don't stop anywhere. The light gets brighter and brighter. All right? Then confrontational Carl or Carla. You ain't even saved. <laughs> You're not a believer in Christ or the Bible. Have no intention of becoming one. You're here to argue. Somebody told you that you should come. It's just crazy. There's a Betsy bug. You know, hey, I hear there's a class down there at that church. I've been going to this church for like six months. I kind of like the music. That preacher? I don't know about that. I, 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 but I heard they got a class. I'm going. You going, Jim? Come on, man. Let me call John, see if he want to go down there. We're going down here and see if we can't trip them up. Ain't got no intention. He even getting saved. Just in him. Hey, you stick out like a soul thumb. We seize you. <laughs> you ain't hiding. You ain't getting away. You know them by the fruit they bear. You, you know, they mean, ornery, cantankerous, <laughs> struggling Sam. Sam, you in here all over this thing. <laughs> struggling Sam or Samantha. You are a believer in Christ, but you have a lot of doubts and struggles. You have never had a safe place to express those doubts. You are here to see if this is the place. Can I get a witness out there? Come on. Now. There you go. If this is, if this is the place, you, 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 you have those doubts. Uh, you struggle as a believer. Um, and, and even sometimes it's the abuse of the past that keeps people from being able to receive in the present. Somebody abused them. Some preacher abused you. Some teacher, some Sunday school teacher, some mother of the church. We got a whole lot of mothers in the church. Last one, curious Carla called. You are not really sure why you're here, but you cited to find out about it. <laughs> Can I get a witness out there? Somebody out there. You ain't really sure why you're here. You just, maybe something will jump off on me. Maybe this is the place, right? These are the types of things that you need to understand and come to grips with that I understand these things, that your leaders understand these things, that there is a diverse group of people here. Oh, I got one more. Wanna answer Will or Wilma? I tried to spell Wilhelmina, but I couldn't figure out how to spell that name. That's, that's across the street from me, Wilhelmina Mosley, lived across the street from me, and Willette, and Wilhelmina, and Will Finer. Oh yeah, she get lost. You have a lot of questions. You are here not to do theology in community, but you're here to write theology down with a pen and paper so you can ask questions later. <laughs> I'm gonna find out, I'm gonna check that out. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna ask him this next week. You know. <laughs> and so as a professor, as teacher, as pastor, teacher, I have to work through all of that because this is your audience. And I think sometimes we forget that the audience is so diverse because lastly, we're all real people created by a real God. And we all have real struggles, real questions, and real convictions, right? And I'm just glad, I'm just glad that you're here. With that said, there's going to be order. There's going to be structure. I'm going to be teaching. That's it. You, you're going to trust who's teaching you. That's it. You ain't going to be one of these knuckleheads. You're going to develop your theology and community. You're going to be glad that you're here like I'm glad you're here. 
And I have a responsibility to God to teach you and to point to you and to give you everything I got. My goal in life is to die empty and fulfilled. So I probably give you more than most pastors and teachers and leaders ever would do. I mean, even on a Sunday morning, I'm not just preaching, I'm treaching. And I'm trying to get some things across to you so that you're able to function in life and be strong and have a good marriage and have good, uh, be a good parent and be a good neighbor and be a good co-worker, be a good friend. My wife and I have been married for 45 years in June. We got saved maybe three weeks, two weeks apart, me first. And we, we ain't never backslid, never went back, never, I ain't never, I have never argued with my wife toe to toe. I've never seen my wife cry. I never had to leave out of my house and go take a drive. She never had to leave, oh God, what have I done? I don't like you, I don't like you. I've never heard that before. My kids are 30-something 30, 30 years old. Never heard a profane word, a cuss word, or me fuss at their mama in their life. And all of that is because of the word of God and the spirit of living God. It ain't got nothing to do with me. It's because of God in me. I don't do that with people, but you'll have people in the church want to go toe-to-toe with a shepherd. And I got a staff. Imagine a sheep running up to a shepherd. Man, I don't like you, man. Bam! Hook, friend, follow me. You don't argue with sheep. I refuse to do that. In the 30 something years of this ministry, I ain't had no argument with a member. Family come to me talking about, we can't stand, we don't like, I don't like this. I never. Every now and then, one or two will pop up their head, and I just look at them. I just go like, I'm trying to help you. I don't want to, I can destroy with my words. I have to show constraint and hope you get better. And in the, in the, the way that the shepherds used to do it, if there was a wayward sheep, a hard-headed sheep, they'd take that staff, they literally would crack the leg. They would break a leg of a ship, a fracture of that leg, and then the sheep couldn't keep up now, so the shepherd has to take that sheep and carry that sheep with it. Now, the sheep is a dumb animal. The sheep think that the shepherd is caring for it, but it's the shepherd that broke his leg. <laughs> and so while the sheep is being carried by the shepherd, the sheep learns the heartbeat of the shepherd, feels the care of the shepherd can't move until the shepherd lifts them can't eat until the shepherd feeds them and so there's a bond there now so now when that sheep is healed that sheep follows because now the sheep also knows the shepherd and not just the shepherd the sheep make sense makes sense to me who is God so here's a little bit of lesson today. I'm going to give you about 20 minutes of a lesson today on who is God. I think we ought to start here because knowing him is important. For them that come to God must first believe that he is. Uh, it's translated often that he exists. And not only that he is, but also that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So this God that I'm going to talk to you about, the God of uh, our Father, uh, our Father, and God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, uh, creator of heaven and earth. Uh, this God uh, exists, and he's a rewarder, right? We can know him, right? How many of you heard the word Trinity? Okay. How many of you have never heard the word Trinity? You'd be surprised there's some people who have never heard the word Trinity, and uh, because they grew up in churches where Trinity is um, heresy. Jesus only churches. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> Elder James. <laughs> when Elder James first came, he came from Bible way. And, you know, Jesus is the father. Jesus is, the, Jesus, Jesus is everything. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And so it's kind of hard to hear Trinity in a place where Trinity is not taught or believed upon, right? Or, or it's not in the Bible, all right? How many of y'all have heard that? Say, Trinity ain't in the Bible. Well, Bible ain't in the Bible. <laughs> I 
Think about it. And so, Trinity. All right? So, the Trinity is a simple expression. All right? Here's a, probably the best chart, the best thing I can do to give it to you, right? Um, the Father. He's up top. You got that? Where's my pointer at? Is that a pointer? Yeah. The Father. The Father, right? The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. But the Father is God. God is the Holy, or the Holy Spirit is God, and the Son is God. So some kind of way, these three are one, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Son, the Father is not the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is not the Father, but the Holy Spirit is God, the Son is God, and the Father is God. That's probably the best way to explain it. Because so many people are talking about, it's like an egg. It's like water, ice, Water, vapor, it's like all of those, the same substance, the same substance, same essence. But it's not quite like that. These three are equal in power all the time, everywhere. They are 100% God. And God himself, who we're going to talk about, the Father, to begin with, is God. I, I found this great picture of God. This is the best picture I could find of God. <laughs> Y'all see how God is spirit. And then that worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. So God is the invisible God, the eternal all wise God. He who exists at everywhere at the same time in all of his fullness. The natural mind cannot understand this, can't grasp this. You've heard me say in the past, if you really thought God and knew who God was, your head would pop off. God is bigger than that. He's bigger than that. No, he's bigger than that. Yes, and he's bigger than that. He could be in Australia and be all that he is and be here all that he is at the same time. He could be on the moon and be all that he is. We know him anthropomorphically. I'm sorry, Susan. I'm scared, Susan. <laughs> Anthropomorphic, meaning that there are human attributes uh, attributed to God so that we can understand God. So when we say God has a mouth, it simply means that God speaks. When you say that God has eyes, it means that God sees. When we say that God has ears, it means that God hears. We say that God has feet, it means that God goes, God moves. And so when we have these human hands, because God touches us. So when you think about these things, that's just simply so that we can understand God. But God doesn't have these things. He is these things. It's like love. People say, well, God is just love. No, God is not just love, but God is love. Love is not God. It always tell people like, like God is just who he is all the time, right? In other words, God, God doesn't have a bottle of water. He is a bottle of water. If you drink it, it's going to still be because God doesn't run out of himself. And God balances himself with himself, right? God doesn't know any less than he ever knew and he doesn't know any more than he ever going to know. He's God. And that's a beautiful picture of God. How many of you like that picture of God? It's an awesome picture of God. And the scripture warns us about images of things in heaven. and things that We need to be very careful. 
That's why, and I'm just tell you why we don't do what we do, right? I'm going to tell you why. I am so concerned about reaching the laws and making sure that we don't offend and making sure that we don't do something that is unnecessarily detrimental to the move and the cause of Christ, right? You don't see any pictures, any images of anything here on the stage. How many of you have been to uh, churches and when the baptismal pool, they got a man standing up there like this at the pool in a robe with a beard? You know, sometimes he black, sometimes he white, sometimes he brown, you know, and they just up there and people walk in off the street and they look up there and they go, that's their Jesus. People have gone to people's homes and they'll have a picture of a dude on the wall. I mean, dude look cool. Dude look like Trevor Lawrence. like Trevor. Long blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, 6'6", six, six, you know, I don't know. Just, you know, and it's like, who is that? Christmas trees. Emblems and stuff. I mean, if, listen to, listen to me about so people won't get me mistaken. If Christmas trees is a part of your family tradition, and there's nothing wrong with traditions, Right? Especially private, family, traditions, McLaughlin's, Williams, Jones. This is what we've done this year, Thanksgiving, all this kind of stuff. That's one thing. But if you think that that tree represents the tree of life, if you think that those lights represent the light of the world, and you think that those things reflect what's going on in heaven, that's a problem. Right? So, amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's not until you hear me say it that you understand it, because some people have asked. They said, "Well, why don't Christmas tree up in here?" Well, I remember uh, my first church. Uh, I pastor. I went down there and <laughs> bless their heart. The um, the 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 pastor there died tragically in a truck crash. Here's how I started pastor. Alcine Caldwell, my friend, brother Curtis Caldwell, Caldwell, uh, horse, you might know Curtis, Curtis Caldwell, he went to school with us, and Curtis' brother, Alcine, was killed tragically in a truck crash. He was pastor, but he also drove for UPS. He ran into the back of a shell oil truck. It blew up, it was killed. So I went and preached at funeral, and I'm down there. So I'm the first voice they really heard, right? And so they asked me would I come back, and they asked me to come back. Elder Shine and I were working in a local church together, hanging out together, splitting them crystal burgers together. <laughs> now that you understand the story properly, all right? Yeah. Elder got up one day and said, let me just straighten out this crystal, <laughs> crystal story. And I wasn't even here. I was, I was on the road, but I was watching, right? I'm like... No, he didn't. He didn't just sit up there and tell them, folks, he ain't never cut no crystal burger with me. Ain't no half a crystal burger. So I had to remind him what I meant by that, right? We had got down to one crystal burger left. And I said, can I have half of it? And he was like, oh. But you know how we use fluorescent paint, right? We paint our own stuff. I said, we, had, we, we were so poor, we just had one Christmas burger and we split it down the middle. So what he was trying to protect was his image. He wasn't poor. I was poor. I wanted the Christmas burger. I was the one that was going down on Riverside selling the blood to get food for my family. I did that. I did that as a pastor. I, I sold a pint of blood, eight dollars, more than three, four times, so that I could take something home to my family, because I had given myself totally over to the things of God, studying the Word of God, doing what I had to do, and God called me to do it. So we have to be careful about pictures of God. There are no pictures of God. Matter of fact, God is a title itself. His name. His name is impronounceable. The Hebrews so reverenced it that they wouldn't even say it. 
We called it the, sorry, scared Susan, the Tetragrammaton, the impronounceable name of God. In the Hebrew, there are no vowels, only consonants. Right? We put the vowels in there for pronunciation. So they put an A and an E in Yahweh. But if you said Y-H-W-H, it's kind of hard to pronounce that. It would simply sound like breath. And God is our breath. He's the air we breathe. And so you, you come into the world, what's the first thing you do? <gasps> Yahweh. When you leave, <gasps> Yahweh. Your spirit comes to you, back to the one that gave it to you. God. We'll stop here. I don't want to get into that just yet. We have too much scared. Susan will run slap out of here. <laughs> but this wonderful picture of God, I want you to get this embedded in your head. I want you. <laughs> you may think there's nothing to this. But can I help you? There's something to this. Now I have two blind people in here, naturally blind. Raise your hand if you can't see that boy. One and Mike. So I want to hook y'all up too. Mike been wanting to meet you. You know, the blind lead the blind. You know, both of y'all blind. <laughs> <laughs> Look here. I got all my blind jokes, so you may well hold on because they're they, they going to be coming. They're going to be coming. But Michael Lee wants to hook up and uh, and you can't see what's on that screen right there. What do you think's on that screen, Mike? A picture of God. What do you think is on that screen? How, can you define it? Can you describe it? I would say being that uh, God is invisible, which is a plain screen. You might need if you don't get no bigger. Give me some damp, boy. He say ain't nothing up there, but I tell y'all, Mike, you see, Mike ain't playing. <laughs> Mike playing all y'all. Mike, Mike playing all y'all. Mike be like, yeah, I, what I would assume that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, ain't nothing up there. Mike, Mike is, uh, Mike has served this ministry and done practically everything you can think of in this ministry, but more than that, he's a friend. Mike, um, uh, prays for me, connects with me, communicates with me, lets me know where he is at all times, how long he's going to be gone, when he's coming back, um, um, been in his home. Uh, we visited uh, the sick together and done some things together and had great conversation together. And um, people make excuses. You know, somebody can make an excuse. It would be somebody who would be totally blind who would be feeling sorry for themselves. And some people I know feel sorry for other people. And those people are some of the best people in the world, enjoying life and enjoying God and enjoying being who they are. And realize that stuff happens, life happens to people. It's what happens to you, is how you respond to life. And we wanna to try to teach you and give you this revelation of God, his son and the Holy Spirit so that when push comes to shove, you can push back. You'll know that this invisible God has your back. And as I said, he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And that's what we're trying to do here. Diligently seek the Lord. Study to show ourselves approved unto God. Be faithful and continue in the things that you've heard. Trust in the one that is teaching. Continue in his word so that you can be disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Amen. 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 Put your hands together and bless the Lord. <laughs> now we're not done. So let me just say this to you. Any questions? Any questions? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, we'll have a link. This lesson, uh, Dominique, they're asking about a link. This message will be put on a link. It could be text to you. It'll be text to you so where you can listen to it again.
All right. Next week, Dom and I, Dom just asked me a little while ago, do we want to stream? And I'm probably going to stream uh, next week. But we need you in the seats if you can be. If you can't be, uh, the inconsistency is the seating you might be able to tell that we need to know how many people are going to be here. We need to know how consistent the people are going to be here. How many understand that theology is best formed in community, that it is good to be with other people, because there will be questions asked and answered that you may not have to ever ask yourself. Somebody else will ask it for you. And don't ever be afraid to ask a question. There is no, well, no, that's, uh, I was going to say there is no stupid question, but there is no wrong question, but sometimes, yes, question. Well, yes, oh, yeah. Yeah, Brother Mike said, well, seeing that you said God is invisible and God is a spirit, then he lifted up his glasses and looked at the screen and said, well, there's probably nothing on the screen. <laughs> We say, well, Mike can see, Mike. <laughs> but no, he, he said that there must not be anything on the screen since you said that God is a spirit and God is invisible. And I said, you got that right. All right. But that's a good, that, that, see, those, those are questions that need to be answered because, you know, even though his wife would have got him before he left, he said, babe, all you do is ask me. <laughs> no, Bible said, wives, ask your husband when you can know. <laughs> all right. Anybody else question? Yeah. Is the registration one time? The registration, but hopefully that your registration is this one time and that you're going to stick with it. All right. Now, the, the overflow, and this is, this, this is the class, but there's several people out of town and stuff this week that's probably going to want to physically be in here. So we'll make room for them. Elder Shider, if you're going to be late, Elder Shider will be teaching the exact same thing in his manner. The way he teaches it, I trust him. I trust the teacher. And uh, we've been together, what, 38 years? 30, almost 40 years. 30, no, 30, yeah, 38 years. 37, 37 years. Um, uh, <laughs> every class together, everything together. I was teaching at uh, 28 years old. I was teaching Monday night teacher staff meeting, Tuesday night Old Testament survey, Wednesday night evangelism and discipleship training, Thursday night New Testament Bible study, Friday night. I worked with the youth Saturday morning. I did the Boy Scouts, the trials for Strut, Brother Lloyd, Helper, Friendly, Curtis County, Beanie, Trip, Fifth, the Break, Lead, Reverend, I'm honored, do my best, do my duty to God and my country to help us be along. I was doing that, teaching Sunday school, teaching, reviewing mass Sunday school, and turning it over to the preacher. Da 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 I was in support ministry, but I was teaching as I went and learning as I went, and Shad and I were learning together and growing together. He brought his experience as a preacher, old Pentecostal preacher, into this. Baptist church. The church was considered a Baptist-coastal church because we were there. <laughs> That's the only reason. I was called the alter ego of the church. The pastor would preach. I only preached there in the three years, almost three years that I was there. How many times did I preach on a Sunday morning? Once, maybe twice. Maybe twice in three years. Served. I was the janitor. I was the finance person. I did everything in the church. Only preached twice in three years. Never complained. Sunday morning, I wasn't, it's always been anticlimactic to me. I've always served. I wasn't trying to be in the spotlight. I was behind the scenes. Mary, Mary Williams were with me the whole while and a couple other people that hung in there with me. All right. 930. Father, thank you for this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. <laughs>